Well, today's speaker's a friend. I got to know her accidentally, uh, like a lot of things happen in your life. Uh, I was at Kitt Peak National Observatory. I was a green graduate student. I was there with my doctoral dissertation advisor, Ken Honeycutt. And we had time on the two meter. And the two meter back then, uh, like the four meter still today, requires an operator. And I have since, by the way, used it without an operator, and I now appreciate what they did. Uh, wow. Anyway, that night the operator was sick or something, and or, or you were assigned. I don't know, but uh, this, uh, you know, little gal shows up, and I think, well, what, what's going on? And she says, oh, I'm your operator. And we had a wonderful time, actually, because with clear weather and everything worked. Even the stars did funny things we expected them to do. <laughs> Uh, she has since actually become director for a time at Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, she's gone to Indiana University, where she's now the IU, I mean, the IU Kirkwood Astronomy Professor, uh, an endowed chair. Uh, she's been in administration. She's, she's been, you president of AAS for a while, too? President of the American Astronomical Society for a while. Uh, the list is so long, I can't begin to remember it all. Uh, but really, really cool things she's doing lately. You know those big telescopes you keep hearing about? That's right up her alley, and that's what she's going to talk about today. So this is Katie Pilchowski. Welcome her, please. Because it's often hard for people to see me when I stand behind a podium, I'll probably move around a lot, so I'm going to use the handheld mic. Let me fire this up, make sure I know what I'm doing. That's a good start. Okay, so adventures in science, building a 30 meter telescope. Now, um, as Ron indicated, my background is not particularly big telescopes. Um, I really like using smaller ones. It's a lot more fun. You get to put your hands on it, you know, you're working with the instrument directly. It's you and the telescope and the sky, and that's really a whole lot more fun. But I also appreciate the value of what big telescopes can do for pushing back the frontiers of science. And so I, I try to be a little bit eclectic in how I appreciate what's, what's around and what the resources we have. And big telescopes are actually really cool and really exciting. So what I want to do is share uh, the current, basically the current status, what's going on, with the 30-meter telescope. This is a project that has just started construction on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And I have had the great good fortune and honor of being involved in the project for the last two years as an appointee by the National Science Foundation to represent the U.S. astronomical community in the development of this project. So I've had a terrific time, and I've enjoyed it. <laughs> and, and I want to share with you some of the things that are going on, just because it's such a cool, cool facility. Now... Um, as Ron politely mentioned, uh, both of us go back a ways in our careers in astronomy. And we both remember the era of the 1980s, 90s, and the early part of the century, which is a tremendous time for telescope building. We went from having the largest telescopes in the world being four, five, and six meters to ones that are six, eight, ten meters in diameter. There was a, just an amazing period of, of design in the 1980s and construction in the 1990s that led to an amazing array of large telescopes. And I've put a few of them up here on the slide so that I can point them out. But here, for example, are the twin Keck 10-meter telescopes on Mauna Kea. Um, and Mauna Kea is a pretty amazing place. Uh, come back with the cursor. Come back here. Where'd you go? My fingers are a little damp, so there we go. Uh, the Subaru Japanese 8-meter telescope. And over here, the Gemini 8-meter telescope, which is an international partnership which the U.S. now holds about a two-thirds share. We have the large binocular telescope built by uh, the University of Arizona and several collaborators, including, I believe, Italy and, and Germany, and the ESO Very Large Telescope for 8-meter class telescopes. These are just a handful of the many telescopes that have been built in the last decade. Um, and I wanted to share this slide with you because it really puts kind of where we are, where we've been, and where we are in perspective. As we look around this amazing chart, we see, let's concentrate not on the big things at the moment, but on the smaller things. So down here we have the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm going to circle it so you can sort of see it. That's um, not such a big telescope, about two meters, but we know it's incredibly powerful. 
the, its, its uh, successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to be launched in just about four years, is going to be substantially larger and is a segmented mirror telescope. The great collection of telescopes built in the last 20 years include the Grand Telescopio Canaria in, um, on, the, in the, uh, on La Palma in the Canary Islands, the Kex, Gemini North and Gemini South, Subaru, South African Large Telescope, Hobby Eberly Telescope, the Large Binocular Telescope, I showed you that picture, the Very Large Telescope, ESOS 4 8 meter telescopes, the Magellan 6.5 meter. So we've had this amazing period of, let's go back, a little too sensitive here, this amazing period of construction and growth in astronomy. There are many other smaller telescopes that are not, not, um, not shown in here, but just, just gives you the range of kind of the wonderful, wonderful things that have happened. The Par Great Paris Exhibition Telescope from 1900 is here. The Yerkes 40 inch, I suspect many of you have visited there, is here. So it gives you some sense of the scale of where we've come in 100 years and where we're headed for this century. Here is a representation of the 30 meter telescope proposed by uh, a consortium, international consortium. Um, the European, I'll come back. The European Extremely Large Telescope, which is shown here as uh, 42 meters, but has now been downscaled a little bit to 39 meters. And the Giant Magellan Telescope, the uh, ESO EELT, and the Giant Magellan Telescope are also in the early construction phase, so it's a really an exciting period. And I want to put this in perspective for everyone. Uh, here on the bottom, on the left, is the size of a tennis court. And here is the size of a basketball court on the right. Whoa. So if you think about what that means, we're talking about telescopes that are the size of this room. These are amazing engineering feats and technically extremely challenging facilities. We're going to have an interesting time to build them, but they also are being built for a reason. That in order to address many of the most interesting and most exciting questions, not all of them, but many of them, uh, we need more glass. We need greater collecting area and greater angular resolution to be able to see the things that we really want to understand about the origin of the universe, about what's in the universe, what it's made of, and the fundamental questions about life elsewhere. It's really very large telescopes that will take us to the answers to those questions. So let me start back with our origins. And I know you've all seen uh, this diagram, um, the cosmic microwave background radiation. First of all, what it really looks like. Um, and you all know that the cosmic microwave background radiation has been a very long story in understanding where this radiation came from and how we can measure it. And this is actually another of my favorite slides because it shows the evolution of our understanding of the cosmic microwave background radiation from the original uh, COBE observations in the, in the early 90s to the WMAP uh, observations about 10 years ago to the more recent Planck observations showing the incredible increase in resolution that we've had in understanding the origin of the uh, at least of understanding the details of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And I start with the CMB because it is so fundamental to our understanding of the origins of galaxies. Of course, I don't have to explain to this audience, that one I guess, what the CMB is showing us. It's showing us very subtle temperature variations from point to point in the uh, color or, or the flux or the... the black body curve of the background radiation itself. And we see very tiny fluctuations in the temperature that indicate differences in location from point to point in the very early universe. And it's those differences in the very early universe that, that allow us to understand how we move from the phase shortly after the Big Bang to the universe that we live in today that has huge, incredible, detailed structure in galaxies, in stars, in clusters of galaxies, in planets, in all of the different bodies that we see and enjoy seeing uh, in the night sky and in the planetarium that we all enjoy. And I wish I'd been here last night. I've heard the new one is amazing, and I hope someday I'll have a chance to, to see what, um, what it can do. But these questions deserve answers. How is the universe put together? How did the first stars and the first galaxies form? How did structure arise? For it was initially a very uniform distribution of matter to something that is incredibly complex today. If we want to understand 
the formation of structure in the early universe, we really need to have large telescopes. It is those telescopes that have the light gathering power that allows us to see and resolve the earliest structures in the universe, where the, the galaxies are forming from clumps of dark matter within clumps of dark matter, uh, collapsing, capturing, and condensing <laughs> ordinary matter to high densities in order to form galaxies and stars. We have here an image, a simulation in the larger image, and a um, Hubble image of some of the earliest galaxies formed in the small inset that is just a piece of what, what probably happened in the very early universe. And in order to detect these early galaxies, we need telescopes like Hubble with its high angular resolution. But in order to really study them requires spectroscopy. We need to get spectra of these things to really understand their, their content, their origin, the motions of stars, their dynamics, what's going on inside of these galaxies. And it's the 30 meter telescopes, the 20 meter telescopes, the 40 meter telescopes that are going to allow us to understand the earliest galaxies in the universe. The cosmic microwave background radiation provides us with the framework that tells us how structure began, how it originated. We know that stars formed very early in the early, in the early days because we can detect variations in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Polarization due to dust. Dust means stars must have been there. But we can't actually detect those stars with the existing facilities that we have. The 30 meter telescope will enable us to see, to study, to measure the first stars formed in the universe after the Big Bang. Here again is a simulation, this one by Betsy Barton, showing the, the uh, initial structures and then the kinds of observations that might be possible with a 30 meter telescope, actually detecting the hydrogen emission from the first stars to form in the universe. The other advantage of a large telescope, 30 meters in diameter, is its angular resolution. A typical telescope today is limited in its angular resolution by the atmospheric sea. If you're lucky and can get time on Hubble, you can do significantly better, but again, Hubble only has an aperture of about two meters. So with a very large telescope and with adaptive optics to correct the Earth's seeing, we can achieve much higher angular resolution on the sky than we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the goal for the 30 meter telescope is something like 0.015 arc seconds angular resolution at 2.2 microns in the infrared. And just to give you an idea of what this means for our ability to study the universe, here's a picture I'm sure you've all seen of the Hubble Deep Field. And if we pick out a small galaxy here in the Hubble Deep Field, that one in particular, uh, it isn't much when we look at it with Hubble Space Telescope resolution. But with the 30 meter telescope and adaptive optics, that galaxy, come back here cursor, will look like this one. We will really be able to see fine detail at very high redshifts, at very high distances away from our local universe. So the resolution that comes from the 30 meters combined with the adaptive optics will really give us an amazing new picture on the universe out there. The question of life elsewhere in the universe is also an important one for us to answer. And the study of exoplanets and the nature of those exoplanets is a critical piece of the science that we're doing today with existing facilities and we'll be able to do substantially better with new facilities. We now know of more than a thousand planets or candidates very convincing candidate planets around other stars, most of those planets are vastly different from what we, we have in our own solar system. Again, it takes large telescopes and special instrumentation, adaptive optics, coronagraphs, to detect and directly measure the light from planets around other stars. And this is another area where the 30 meter telescope, the 20 meter telescope, um, and the European extremely large telescope will also be able to excel. Imaging planets is a hard thing to do. They're adjacent to very bright stars and they're very dim. So it does take special techniques. This particular image is of a brown dwarf orbiting a star that is, um, the planet is about as far as Saturn is from our sun. And you can see just how difficult it is to detect those, those faint planets. But what the TMT will be able to do is not only detect those planets, but take spectra of those planets. And with the spectra, and again, this is a simulation of what we expect to see with a 30 meter telescope, we can get spectra of those planets. There are a couple of techniques. One is to try to get a spectrum directly. Another is to take a spectrum of the 
planet as it transits in front of the star, subtract out or divide out the star spectrum, and we'll be left with just the planet spectrum. And with that, those techniques, either directly or looking at the absorption of elements in the planet's atmosphere, we'll be able to detect molecules in the planet's atmosphere, study the atmospheres of the planets, and perhaps find signatures of life. So interesting science we can do. Within the solar system, the 30 meter will also make extraordinary new observations of objects in our solar system. And here is a simulation of what we can expect to see on the moon of Jupiter, Io, uh, with the 30 meter telescope. The first image on the left is what Keck can now do today with uh, adaptive optics, improving, uh, removing the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, with advanced adaptive optics on Keck, the moon will look something like this, but with a 30 meter telescope and adaptive optics, we will get extraordinary resolution on the moons of Jupiter. Um, it is really mind-boggling what we'll be able to do, but the kinds of science that we'll be able to do is, to, for example, to study methane rainfall on Titan, to study geysers on Enceladus, um, geysers blowing in the wind on Triton, asteroid morphology and composition, and organics and pre prebiotic molecules in comets. It's just an amazing array of solar system science. I served last week on the uh, allocation committee that awards NASA time on the Keck telescopes, and we had the pleasure of reviewing three proposals in support of the New Horizons mission, which will reach Jupiter next summer. And Keck will be very busy in supporting uh, those observations from the ground, but in particular, I was struck by how important it is for us to understand weather and, and, and physical phenomena on icy planets. As we look toward the future in, in trying to understand the nature of exoplanets, we really have to understand much more about the bodies in our own solar system. Um, here on Earth, it's water and carbon that drive climate that, that are in cycles that connect the atmosphere and the oceans and the Earth together. But on icy planets, which we'll be able to study with these new telescopes, and which we're finding with Kepler and other missions, we don't know much about how those planets work in a, in a geological sense. It's actually methane that drives weather that's involved in rain, in clouds, in surface, surface liquids on, on those bodies. And understanding those phenomena in our solar system is critically important to understanding exoplanets in the future. So the 30 meter will play an important role in understanding those kinds of phenomena in our solar system to allow us to understand exoplanets around other stars. So let me talk a little bit about the 30 meter telescope itself. We obviously start with a legacy of the Keck telescopes uh, built in the 1990s, the first one in operation in 1993 and the second one in operation in 1996 on Mauna Kea. The Keck telescopes operate with segmented mi uh, mirrors, not monolithic mirrors, and they represented a real breakthrough in the technology for telescope design. They, they have diameters of 10 meters, so in the standards of the 2020s, they're relatively small telescopes. Why 30 meters? Why is that the next stopping place for telescope construction, this range of 20 to 40 meters? The reasons are threefold. First, it's important to get the biggest aperture possible. It gives us the greatest increase in angular resolution, the ability to see faint objects, but we need to balance technology risk and cost against science gain. And 30 meters is a good place where the technology risk isn't too great, the cost doesn't escalate totally beyond the bounds of reality, and yet the science gains are really tremendous. We have the legacy of the very successful Keck telescopes to give us a technological starting point, which we can then develop further to get to larger aperture. And it turns out that 30 meters is also the best balance for adaptive optics in terms of how the technology for adaptive optics is improving, where the technological pace of improvement is, is headed, and what we might be able to do in the 2020s and 2030s. Larger than 30 meters is almost hard to imagine that we could be successful. So 30 meters is about as big as we can go and still think that we can have successful adaptive optics. So 30 meters turns out to be just about the right balance. <laughs> Uh, the TMT partnership, the 30 meter telescope partnership, is a collaboration amongst the University of California, Caltech, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which has provided the seed funding to get the whole project started, 
and the international partners, including Canada, China, India, and Japan. So it's a large international consortium. They have selected Mauna Kea as their site and have actually now started construction. The proposed site of the 30-meter telescope is not on the summit of Mauna Kea, but is rather on the northern shield below the summit. It's very difficult to uh, have new construction on the summit of Mauna Kea. It's very difficult to have construction anywhere on Mauna Kea. But the northern shield, after a detailed site study, appears to have excellent seeing qualities, just as the summit does, and appears to be an equally good location for the telescope. So the TMT will be located north on the lava field uh, below the summit of Mauna Kea. Up here, again, we see the Keck twin telescopes, the Gemini telescope in the background, Subaru telescope, and the road that comes up um, from below, from the north or south side of the mountain, comes up around the summit cone, comes through here, the submillimeter valley, they call it, and then a new road that's extending down across the shield to the TMT site. The telescope, well, think about a bridge, what's involved in construction to make something of that size, or, or a, a domed stadium. It's a complicated, large piece of machinery that's really pretty amazing, I think. Let me talk a little bit about the design of the telescope. It's a Ritchie Chrétien optical design, which means that the, the primary mirror surface is har, 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 I can't I say this word hyperboloid is a hyperboloid. I want to say hyperboloidal, um, as, as is the secondary mirror at the top. The primary mirror is made of optical glass segments that are held together and controlled very precisely. The secondary mirror here up at the top is also hyperboloidal. It's three meters in diameter. The secondary mirror is three meters in diameter. Uh, the, there's a tertiary mirror, so the light comes down from the top, reflects off the primary mirror, up to the secondary mirror, and down to a tertiary mirror here, only two and a half meters in diameter. Um, well, not quite. It's, it's ellipsoidal, so it's 3.5 meters in one side, that reflects the light off to the side to instruments that are mounted on Naismith platforms on either side of the telescope. The total field of view available will only be about 20 arc minutes, um, and that field of view is six and a half meters in diameter. So it's a huge field of view. Plate scale is uh, very small compared to normal standards. Don't want to do that. Let's go to this one. Oh, come on. Go away. The mirror of the telescope will be nearly 500 segments put together to make up the full 30 meter surface of the mirror. Um, each segment is 1.4 meters in diameter, so it's a pretty amazing engineering feat to put them all together. Uh, and here you see a cutaway of the telescope with the instrument platforms on the side, the mirror surface and the support structure underneath to support the primary mirror and to move the whole telescope to its proper sky pointing, and then the secondary mirror up here at the top. Remember, it's the size of a basketball field. It's um, amazingly big. The dome itself is 56 meters high, and the telescope is about 36 meters wide, not counting the Naismith platforms. From the bottom of the telescope to the top is 51 meters in size. So it really is an amazing construction project. It's huge in size. The enclosure for the TMT will be also very innovative. Instead of a standard dome with a shutter, a slit that opens to the sky, they're using this new arrangement called a Kalat enclosure. The lower section, this section here with the, with the ventilation in it, uh, <coughs> rotates in the normal way around a vertical axis, and the upper section rotates um, around a tilted axis. So it rotates around, and with the combination of the two motions, they can point the open section anywhere in the sky above 65 degrees elevation. The advantages of this dome are that it's a lower cost and lower weight. Uh, and cost is important, and you'll see later how much this project is going to cost. But it will be a very innovative dome, and it just sort of captures the imagination of a forward-looking kind of a facility. As I mentioned already, the Keck telescopes provide the heritage for the mirror, and in fact, most of the structural design of the telescope. Keck has 36 segments to make up its mirror surface. So we really are going from 36 to nearly 500 segments in order to expand this technology to 30 meters. 
Uh, and it's going to be scary big, I think. Um, there's a person here, a model of a person standing next to this engineering drawing of the telescope. So you get some idea of the scale of what this facility is going to be like. Uh, and it's not easy to make 500 segments for this mirror. They're actually making nearly 600 segments because they need spares as well. If you want to keep this telescope functioning, you have to be able to take out segments and clean them and reilluminize them and put them back. So they have a spare for each different type of segment that they need to make up a hyperboloidal surface. There are 82 different types of curvature on the surface of the different segments of this mirror. The mirrors are themselves 40, about 1.4 um, meters across. They're 45 millimeters thick. I'll show you some pictures. And the gaps in between the mirror segments are just about two and a half millimeters in size. So they're held very, very tightly together so that there's very little obscuration or empty space between the mirrors of the telescope. Here's a picture of a prototype of one of the mirrors. They start round and then they cut them into hexagons so that they fit together. Um, and there's a support structure underneath it to show you sort of what that looks like, but it gives you some idea of the thickness to diameter ratio for these, these things. This is just a prototype of one of the segments that's put together. But the primary segment fabrication um, and polishing is actually very well advanced. There, the segments are being produced in four countries, in the U.S. by Tinsley and by other companies in India, China, and Japan. Each of those countries is also producing a fraction of the segments for the telescope. Uh, these pictures come from China and Japan and the U.S., but in fact, there are segments also under construction in India. And mirror segment production is... Uh, we need all four countries to be actively producing mirror segments in order to produce them at a fast enough rate to complete construction on the schedule that's planned. The glass is being provided by the Ohara Glass Company in Japan. Uh, they provide glass for many, many telescope mirrors, and they do an extraordinarily good job of providing the glass. But here you see uh, the blank segments um, being ready for polishing. Um, the polishing in Japan is being done by Canon, and these are, are aspheric elements, right? They're not uh, spherical individual mirrors. Each one has its own special curvature shape to fit the hyperbola of the telescope design. So those are coming along very well. The support assemblies are also starting construction. The design work has been completed. The, the supports for these mirrors will, will be supports for seven mirrors together, and then these seven segment uh, sections will fit together to produce the whole surface area of the mirror. Um, and the control system for maintaining the focus, location, tilt, every, all of the f degrees of freedom of each segment has already been developed by uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in collaboration with Caltech. Here's an des engineering design document or design image for what the um, actual segment controls look like. In order to achieve the kind of image quality that they need for this telescope with the adaptive optics, they have to control every segment and phase them together uh, absolutely perfectly to make it work. And they have a control system from the legacy of Keck that will allow them to do this. The three meter secondary support requires, uh, you have to hold up a three meter mirror up there in space. And they're looking at a couple of different configurations for the best way to support the secondary, minimizing the obscuration and maximizing the stability of where the secondary is held so that it doesn't, doesn't move around at all. The operations requirements for this telescope uh, require that it be able to slew to a new object in less than five minutes. Now that's a, that's a basketball court moving around to a new location pointing up um, very quickly on the sky and to switch instruments from one Naismith port to the other in less than 10 minutes. So they want to maximize the science production of the telescope uh, because otherwise you're wasting, t wasting time and money. So they're designing this telescope to be very nimble and to be able to move very quickly and to acquire new objects very quickly. I want to talk for a minute about the importance of adaptive optics. Not only does it allow us to achieve the diffraction limit of the telescope to get the highest possible angular resolution on the sky, but it also improves our ability to see faint objects. So for example, uh, we want to take advantage of the, the 30 meter area a diameter and full area of the mirror. For normal seeing limited observations, limited by the, the 
degradation of the image quality that we get from the atmosphere, the gain that a telescope has goes as the square, the diameter, simply the area of the primary mirror. Uh, so if we increase the diameter of the telescope by a factor of three, from 10 meters to 30 meters, we can see, uh, uh, this, is, this is trying to put this in visual terms, the ability of, to see faint objects, the sensitivity of the telescope increases by a factor of nine. And that's important for the telescope. But with adaptive optics, we not only can get larger collecting area, we can concentrate the light into a smaller sized image. And that also improves our sensitivity. So with adaptive optics, we can go from the equivalent of a 10 meter telescope to the equivalent of a much larger telescope because the, the sensitivity of our ability to detect faint objects increases to the fourth power of the diameter. And so we go a factor of three increase in telescope diameter to a factor of 63 increase in the uh, ability to detect faint objects. And so that adaptive optics turns out to be really important. We've waited a long time as astronomers to have success from adaptive optics, to be able to use it routinely, to be able to benefit in many different types of observations from adaptive optics to improve the quality of images. But it's wonderful to watch as the number of scientific papers explodes, the ones that use adaptive optics. This is a, a chart of the number of papers published uh, from 1965 on up to 2011 using adaptive optics with various telescopes. And you'll see this dark blue region is the Keck telescope. Uh, they are just doing wonderful things with their ability to improve image quality, to correct for the atmosphere, to get the sharpest possible images with the 10 meter telescopes. And that legacy will pass on to the 30 meter telescope. That advantages of adaptive optics are being felt in all different areas of astronomy, from solar system to galactic astronomy, studies of stars in the Milky Way, to extragalactic astronomy. In all cases, the improved quality of images is making a big difference, and TMT will take advantage of that. The instrument that it will use for the adaptive optics to produce the high quality images is called Nefarious. Isn't that a wonderful name for an instrument? <laughs> Narrow Field Adaptive Optics System. And it will reside on one of the two Naismith ports, uh, and it will feed two first light instruments, the IRMS and the IRIS. These are infrared spectrometers, two different types. And we expect that, well, the adaptive optic system is designed to be pretty complicated. It will correct effects of the atmosphere at the low level, at ground level, and also correct the effects of atmosphere at 11 kilometers above the observatory. That 11 kilometer height is one in which there's a boundary layer above Mauna Kea where there's a substantial amount of turbulence. Below that, the air is smooth. Above that, the air is smooth. But at 11 kilometers, there's a boundary layer where we get a lot of turbulence. And so the nefarious will correct both ground layer disturbances in the images and the 11 kilometer height disturbances. It will use six sodium lasers shining up at the sky to produce artificial stars that they will use to measure and correct the distortions of the atmosphere, and then feed the light into the two instruments, IRIS and IRMS. IRIS is the infrared imaging spectrometer, combination of taking deep infrared images and also permitting um, spectroscopy of those <coughs> diffraction-limited images. It'll be moderate resolution um, spectroscopy and will allow a very, very high angular resolution infrared imaging. The infrared multi-slit spectrometer, I think, is really a fascinating instrument. It will take beautiful images of very high angular resolution, but inside the instrument are 46 little slits that can be positioned left or right to fall on any object in the field of view at that particular position. So they will be able to get spectra simultaneously of 47 or 46 different objects in their field of view, each slit falling on a different object as it goes down. So it'll be tremendously powerful in terms of, of getting uh, infrared spectra. The other first light instrument, the wide field optical spectrometer, is intended to be a natural seeing instrument, not to use the adaptive optics. And they had a fabulous design that they uh, were going to go with to build it, uh, build the optical spectrometer to have it available at first light. I should stress that these optical spectrometers, 
uh, are the workhorse instruments that almost every telescope has one, and they are the most popular instrument on every single telescope on the planet. People want and need optical spectroscopy to study the, study the universe in all kinds of different ways. As it turned out, when they looked very closely at the optical design, they were starting with a Keck design, an instrument on Keck, and trying to scale it up to a 30-meter scale. Uh, they forgot a couple of things, and it turns out that the optics that they uh, plan to scale up don't come big enough to fit. <laughs> so uh, you, can't, you simply can't get glass of the diameter they need for a 30-meter telescope. So they've gone back to the drawing board for a redesign of the optical spectrometer, and they'll be putting out an announcement of opportunity to the community for design work uh, to come up with new visions for how to uh, build the optical, optical spectrometer that the telescope will need. Uh, its scale is huge. The instrument is about eight meters in diameter, so it's not small. Uh, it, in order to accommodate the, the wide... Uh, the field of view, which is big, you have to have a big instrument for this telescope. And so that's one that's still, uh, still on the drawing boards. Good thing they didn't start spending money before they figured all that out. So here's some idea of what these instruments are going to cost, and this is just a prelude to what the telescope itself is going to cost. The wide field optical spectrometer they figure will cost about $60 million. The two infrared instruments, one a little more complex and one a little bit simpler, will cost between 20 and $40 million each. So that's easily $100 million just for these three instruments for this telescope. So hold your breath there, and we'll go on to how much is it really going to cost. They're also planning additional instruments beyond the first light when there will be more demand for different kinds of scientific capabilities. They want to have a planet formation instrument that will be specially designed to study planets, image planets around other stars, a high-resolution optical spectrometer, uh, other high-resolution spectrometers at different wavelength regions, so that we have not only low-resolution spectroscopy, but high-resolution spectroscopy on the telescope. The project history has been an interesting one. It was the top recommendation of the Decadal Survey in 2000, 2001. It was a recommendation of, of the National, uh, National Academy's study of what to do in astronomy that we begin technology studies for the development of what was called then the giant segmented mirror telescope. Understanding we're not going to get a 20 or 30 meter monolithic mirror, a segmented mirror was what we needed to have. It's the top recommendation that funding begin to um, start design of a, a giant telescope facility. The decade of the, the first decade of the century was not a good one for science funding, and there simply was not enough money available to make substantial progress on um, how we might build such a, such a facility. But fortunately, the Moore Foundation stepped in and provided uh, tens of millions of dollars for the initial design effort for the 30-meter telescope. That money was given by the foundation to, uh, to Caltech and to the University of California to start the project rolling. And it began with an initial award of about $17 million, and that total has gone up to where their total contribution to the project will be of order nearly $200 million by the time it's done. In 2005, they began the serious design studies to understand what it's going to take to build this telescope. In 2008, the National Optical Astronomy Observatory of Japan decided to join the design effort. In 2009, more funding was awarded from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, and early, the early construction phase began. The Chinese decided to join the project also in 2009 at the design and engineer, beginning engineering level, and in 2010, a consortium of institutes in India decided to join the project. And Canada was part of the initial uh, discussions about the design effort on the telescope. Their goal was to start construction uh, in 2014, and I'm pleased to say they have achieved that goal at this point. The schedule for the project looks something like this. Uh, they were in the design development phase prior to 2009. Since 2009 until the present day, They've been in what's called the early construction phase, and they have just 
formally started construction of the project on Mauna Kea. They expect to start early operations in the early 2020s and to be in full operation in 2025. Uh, all of the major critical systems have been designed. They have confident engineering designs for everything except that wide field optical spectrograph. Uh, the, the consortium formally entered phase one of construction last May uh, with the formal approval by Caltech, University of California, and the Japanese uh, to, to begin the project. The total cost of this project with instrumentation through construction phase is $1.2 billion in 2012 dollars. And it's, it's one of the interesting things about being part of the project development has been understanding how you actually finance a big project like this. It's not easy. So early contributions, you have to account the cost of money, you have to deal with inflation, you have to fold all of these economic factors into it. The actual cost of construction in real year dollars between the start of construction and the end of construction will be $1.5 billion in order to get this telescope into operations in 2025. So it's come a long ways and it's been an interesting ride. The most difficult piece has not actually been the engineering, but has been getting the right to build the facility on Mauna Kea. The mountain, the volcano in Hawaii, which we all continue to hope is, remains extinct, uh, <laughs> is sacred to native Hawaiian peoples and is within a, a large conservation district. So use of the mountain is very, very highly regulated. And there's a very detailed permitting process that uh, is required in order to successfully get permission to uh, build construction on the mountain. The Hawaii site was selected in 2009. The project did extensive site testing on several sites and determined that the Mauna Kea site was actually the best for a variety of reasons. It's a combination of the image quality due to the stability of airflow over the mountain, the number of clear nights, the dryness of the site, the, all of those factors together uh, make it astronomically the best site on the planet. Uh, politically, it's not the best site on the mountain. It's a very difficult site to get permission to use. But the Land Use Board in Hawaii uh, granted approval for construction for the location use of the site in 2013. It's a very long and extended process. The project uh, did a lot of work to uh, make the project important to the people of Hawaii. It involves economic development, it involves education efforts, it involves all of the different ways in which in external investment can benefit a local population, including a, a very, very important degree of respect for local traditions and local cultures. The plans were approved and use permits or building permits, uh, construction permits were issued by the county building inspector this last summer. So all the permitting processes have, on, have, have gone through, um, through the Mauna Kea Conservation Board, through the state land use, through the county processes, all of those have gone through with approval. The project made an extraordinary effort to connect with the local population, to present the plans, to listen to the local population, to understand what the impact was and to mitigate the impacts as much as possible. There are many reasons why the site of Mauna Kea is important to Hawaiian people. Culturally, it's central to their, uh, their way of life on the big island of Hawaii. It's a place where uh, traditional burials have taken place. There are human remains that need to be respected. There are endangered species on the mountain. It is just central to all facets of island life. The site that was actually selected for the TMT was selected very carefully to be away from any regions which had extreme or, or heavy cultural sensitivity. Those tend to be concentrated on the summit and not on the northern shield of the mountain. So it's a relatively uh, safe place. But nonetheless, the mountain, the, the, the mountain staff are very sensitive to their responsibility to maintain and respect the integrity of the site to the extent you can when you're doing construction. And they are very carefully monitoring. Uh, they have documented every rock, 
every piece of lava, every twist and turn of the uh uh-uh before they start construction so that when they are done, when the project is finished in 50 years, uh, which is the expected life of the telescope, they can go back and return the site to its original condition. It's all been very carefully documented. And they're monitoring everything that everyone does, every construction worker, to make sure that nothing disrespectful happens on the top of the mountain. So all of the approvals are now in place, site construction permits are issued, and site construction has started. And I want to show you a few of those pictures. Ah, I I should tell you a little bit more about the politics first. I forgot I put this in. So um, for on-site construction, they have started the process. The estimated cost, as I said, is $1.2 billion in 2012 dollars. Caltech and the University of California, with primarily with funding from the Moore Foundation, are committed each to providing a 10% share of the telescope. So UC and Caltech each get 10% of the telescope time. Canada is trying to get 19% of the telescope time, and they are struggling. Uh, they had hoped that the Canadian government would include funding for their share of TMT in last year's fiscal last year's budget announced last March. It was not included, uh, but Canada hasn't said no. So they're trying very hard to get it included in Canada's budget for this year. If that's not successful, it's not clear what's actually going to happen. China is committed for 10%. Japan is committed for 19%. And India is committed for uh, 10%. That leaves the project somewhere between 10 and 20% short in the available funding. So new partners are still needed, or they will de-scope a little bit. They'll drop out an instrument or two. They will uh, perhaps defer the outer ring of segments around the telescope. But they are committed to going ahead with construction, even at the present funding level. So the site work actually began in November of, of 2012 with some early geotechnical testing. In order to design the foundation for the observatory, you need to know what's underground. So they began with um, some seismic testing to, to sort of investigate what's under the surface of the lava at that particular site. And they found it was a fairly stable surface with a possibility of a lava tube in one section where they hoped to put the observatory. They're still not sure if there's a lava tube there or not. If there is, they're going to have to fill it with concrete in order to make sure that the site is perfectly stable. But they've planned for that in the design and construction. Starting uh, this last summer, there were additional uh, bulldozers up on the mountain that started uh, improving the roadway to get down to the site and actually leveling the site itself. They did additional geotechnical boring and grade, uh, geotechnical boring in order to study to get uh, more information about the integrity of the rock layers below uh, where they need to build the foundation so they could do the final foundation design. And they've been busy since then with site preparation work uh, in in ready to start construction. Because of the weather on Mauna Kea, they're not going to have people working this winter. It's just too difficult to work up there in the wintertime at 14,000 feet. But starting in the early spring, they'll be back fundamentally beginning this building construction, enclosure construction on site, or ready for the enclosure construction on site. The enclosure itself will be built in Canada, and that has been an important aspect of getting this, this project off the ground. Canada, India, China, and Japan all see the TMT project as a way to promote economic and industrial development in their countries. 70% of their contributions to the construction of the observatory are spent in country on uh, work packages for the design and construction of the observatory. So it's providing direct benefit to uh, companies and workers in each of those countries, developing high-tech industries for, for economic development. So it's a, it's a win-win for the countries to be involved. 30% of the funding comes to the project itself for, for construction on Mauna Kea and for some of the instrument work. Canada is, is planning to build the enclosure. The enclosure will be built in Canada, assembled in Canada, tested in Canada, disassembled, and then shipped and installed on the site. So uh, work has been progressing very well. They, this is an image of a rock crusher. They've been collecting the lava rock and crushing it to make uh, crushed rock that they use in the construction site. They're not bringing up additional rock uh, because that provides contamination 
of the, of the material on the mountain. They want to be careful not to contaminate the mountain with other materials. It turns out, for example, that um, there's an endangered bug up on the northern shield. And if they bring up materials from, from sea level, it might contain other insects that will be predators to the endangered bug. So there are the many different ways you have to respect the, both the environmental and cultural sensitivities about the mountain. I was able to attend or almost attend the groundbreaking, which occurred a few weeks ago, earlier this month, on Mauna Kea. Um, the groundbreaking was scheduled. Uh, we, we took buses from uh, Waikoloa on the west side of the island up the, across the saddle road to the point between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa where the road goes up Mauna Kea. We saw there a large group of protesters uh, having a protest by the side of the road, and we sort of waved and went on up. We stopped at Halipahaku, the mid-level facility at 9,000 feet, to acclimatize for an hour, have a cookies, use the restroom, that sort of thing, get a safety briefing. And then we piled back in buses to go back up to the summit. And during that interval, those protesters moved from the saddle road up to the top of the mountain, and they actually blocked the road. So here they are, standing on the road, uh, refused to allow the vehicles to the site. The site is about a half a mile from where the road was blocked, and so a small number of people walked through the protesters and went, um, went to the site itself. And here is an image of what they found at the site. As soon as the protesters saw that there were people sneaking past, they ran, back to the, ran from the road back to the site and um, disrupted the ceremony completely. So here you see our visiting dignitaries from China, Japan, and India. Um, these are Japanese visitors, Indian visitors. This, this is a prominent astronomer from China, um, not having his picture taken. And here are the protesters. It was an amazing day. It was fascinating to watch the interactions. The project uh, is, again, being very sensitive to the cultural needs of the island, decided not to have any arrests, to so just proceed as in a friendly kind of way, respectful of listening to what the protesters had to say, understanding their point of view, um, but proceeding nonetheless. The ceremony was disrupted. The formal ceremony did not take place because we were shouted down by the protesters. But before the protesters got there, the blessing of the site for construction took place. So the shaman from Native Hawaiian shaman came and did the blessing ceremony so that construction could proceed before the actual uh, groundbreaking ceremony itself took place. We had a wonderful party afterward, but we were not able to actually complete all of the plans that we had for the site itself. So in some sense, you know, it's kind of disappointing. On the other hand, it's probably the most memorable groundbreaking ever. <laughs> In it for a telescope. So I want to talk a little bit about the landscape of the extremely large telescopes. The countries with national access to large telescopes, the EELT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, and the 30-meter telescope are these. There's a whole list of them here. You'll see one is missing. And then there is a list of US universities and institutions that are involved either with TMT or with the Giant Magellan Telescope. And you'll see a list of particular institutions here, Caltech, Carnegie, Harvard, uh, University of Arizona, California, University of Chicago, University of Texas, Texas A&M. But there's something key that's missing from this picture. And what's missing from this picture is the US astronomical community. There is no funding available from the National Science Foundation for broad US participation in either the 30 meter telescope or the giant Magellan telescope. So the US astronomical community, except for those individuals at member institutions of the TMT collaboration, will not have access to these facilities. Recognizing that that's a problem, the National Science Foundation awarded a cooperative agreement to the TMT Observatory Corporation to explore a partnership model, anticipating sometime in the future when the NSF might have more funds available um, how would the U.S. participate in this project? As part of that uh, cooperative agreement, there are U.S. community members on the governing board of the observatory as affiliate members of the board. Um, there is a significant outreach effort underway to inform and advise the U.S. community about 
uh, what the opportunities are for participation in TMT. And it certainly is the case that there's enough remaining open share in the construction budget for the U.S. to participate. But at the moment, the National Science Foundation does not have the funds or the detailed plans to uh, make that happen. So we don't actually have opportunities to uh, use the telescope. But right now, the chair of the Science Advisory Committee for the TMT project is a community member. The community is very engaged in this project, even though as yet we don't have a, an official share of the project. There's a lot of work going on to support U.S. participation. We hope that by 2018 or 2020, we'll be able to find appropriate funding at the National Science Foundation that the U.S. can become a partner in this particular project. That is still to be determined, so I'm going to leave you with this slide, with the TMT puzzle, and uh, ask if you have any questions. Thank you very much. You mentioned that the protesters were blocking the, the groundbreaking ceremony. What were they protesting? Is it cultural, environmental? I mean, there are other observatories there. Yes. So what were they specifically protesting about this one? So there were um, many different things they were protesting. The most prominent, there were, there were two, I would say, that were most prominent. Um, there was an... A statement, or there was a belief amongst the protesters that the project had not followed all legal procedures in order to get permission to use the site. In fact, the project did every possible thing they could. The project is also contributing a million dollars a year to support education and workforce development efforts on the Big Island. That's part of its ongoing commitment to supporting the, the population on the island. And they have jumped through every possible legal hurdle. But that was one of the issues that the protesters raised. The second issue, um, in addition to, to several of the others that were less prominent, the second issue was an issue of Hawaiian independence. That I think that the protesters saw this very public event as an opportunity to showcase their wish that Hawaii secede from the US and become an independent nation. So that was one of the principal arguments that the protesters placed in front of us. There were also concerns about groundwater pollution, um, disruption of sacred sites, and general disrespect for the culture, cultural value of the mountain. So there were a mixture of things, but I would say the, the anti-statehood issue and the uh, legal, legal procedural issues were the two main, main issues. Work up there, uh, in construction work. I understand yeah. astronomers have their own issues, but I'm just curious. So um, it is hard, but people acclimatize pretty well. Um, there is a fairly well trained workforce on the island of people who are have done a construction up there before. There's a lot of construction experience. People people know how to do that, and the workforce that works there on a regular basis. You get more red blood cells, you just basically acclimatize to working at that altitude. Much higher than 14,000 feet, it's very difficult to do that. So 15, 16, 18,000 feet, it's much harder. But 14 is, is doable, and so that seems to, be, seems to be okay. There was a question over here? Yes, uh, there's a question about U.S. community participation in this project. So in the uh, International ALMA project, which was built in Chile, a condition of uh, allowing, you know, part of the negotiation for allowing that facility to be built in Chile was that the Chilean, the nascent Chilean astronomical community would have uh, like 10% yes. of the telescope time. So this telescope will be built in what is, for now, the United States. Why not do something similar and say that that's one of the conditions is that our astronomers get to meet and, it's, and the Chileans do get paid for their site as well. It's not about yes, that's correct. The uh, site arrangement allows that 7.5% of the telescope time is given to astronomers at the University of Hawaii. So it's, it's um, the use of the land. It's not federal land. It's state land. 
And so it's University of Hawaii astronomers who benefit from that arrangement. But they will get 7.5% of the telescope time. So if you know of students who are interested in astronomy, the University of Hawaii is a great place to go. <laughs> uh, Ron tells me that we need to cut off questions, but I'll be here for a little while this afternoon if you have other questions you'd like to ask.